Good evening. Uh, let me call to order the regular city council meeting for the city of St. Helena for Tuesday, September 12th. Uh, will the vice mayor lead us in the place? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, Ms. Ms. Jaffopoulos, roll call, please. Wow. Jaffopoulos. <laughs> Mayor Galbraith. Here. Vice Mayor White. Here. Councilmember Doring. Here. Ellsworth. Here. Coberstein. Here. All right. Uh, next item is a public forum. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us with respect to matters of municipal concern that are not on our agenda tonight, and public comment is limited to three minutes. Please. Good evening. My name is Anthony McKelly. I live 1125 Cornell. I've been here before, and I've told you I don't use city water, so I'm on a standby meter, so to speak, just like your water contracts that you have with 31 wineries that are in the city or outside the city. Now, for them, though, I've got a 5 eighths meter, and I pay $52, or all my friends pay $52. But they're only charged four dollars. I don't understand that. It's a commercial business. If you got a four inch line, you're only charging them four dollars. You're losing money all the time. I don't know why nobody found that. I mean, I just happened to be aware of it the other day that these people are getting away with murder. I mean, if you're outside the city like B V or Inglenook and those people have fire contracts, they only pay eight dollars a month. That's kind of ridiculous. And you're charging us residents that don't use water. They're just like them, standby customers, $52 a month. It's just not fair. And I know you're having that water study money, and maybe somebody could look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm agreeable to that because I've got one of those standby meters, too. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, further public comment? All right. Uh, that would then take us to reports by staff and city council, future agenda items, and AB 123 four reports. I could begin perhaps by saying we met in closed session and uh, to my understanding there was no reportable action. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, Mr. Preswich. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of items to update the City Council and the community on. Uh, this past week the City Council held a governance meeting and just a couple of outcomes of that meeting. Um, one, you may notice on the agenda tonight a more descriptive uh, description for our recommendations. Those will become increasingly descriptive over time. Uh, that was one of the requests by our city council. Also, uh, the council has requested that we publish the agendas an additional week in advance. And so we've looked at a calendar, and we believe we're going to be targeting the meeting of October 24th for that transition. So the community can expect to see council agendas posted one week earlier than they are today. Uh, secondly, the council identified a goal setting workshop for October 4th. That will begin at 5 p.m. and be held at the fire station from 5 to 9 is the anticipated timeline for that. Additionally, the city staff is working on introducing a quarterly newsletter. Uh, I anticipate that will probably begin this fall. And so that will be an additional opportunity to enhance communication uh, with City Hall and the community. Uh, you may notice that the city posted the staff report for the special meeting of, um, to discuss water rates. That meeting will be held next Monday, September 18th. The staff report and documents were posted to the website this afternoon, and I believe we may have some additional copies in the back of the room. And finally, just a note, uh, looking ahead to the calendar, it looks like the council has a meeting scheduled on a city holiday uh, on December 26th, so at some point we'll look for guidance on whether to cancel that meeting or postpone it to a different date. Okay, that's a good catch. Uh, Ms. Mitz? Thank you, council members, members of the public. Uh, I'm just reiterating what Mark said. We did post the uh, various rate models online today. There are 10 different scenarios that are posted, four for the wastewater system and six for the water system. They are available online on our website, as well as I believe we have 15 printed copies in the back. We'll also make copies available at City Hall and at the library. All right. Uh, Ms. Jopopoulos? <laughs> I didn't get that right? Close. Miss City Clerk. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Hausch? Nothing this evening. Thank you. Ms. Smithies? Nothing to report. Uh, Ms. Crichton? Good evening. Um, I'm proud to report that we had 479 kids sign up for our summer reading program this year. Uh, so far, 90 of those kids have read 100 books and have earned a place in our Readers Hall of Fame. Um, our summer reading program is not over until September 31st, so I'm sure the list will grow. Um, on a programming note, this Thursday at 6.30, um, you can join us at the library for Wild St. Helena uh, to learn more about Napa Valley's native bats and to get a chance to see them up close. <clears throat> How close? Very close. <laughs> <laughs> I've already seen them up close, but uh, somebody else maybe hasn't. So they will be in the building, and this time legitimately. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hopefully nobody needs to get the bat net that's in the back room. Oh. Um, also, I'm excited to report that the St. Helena Library has been selected by WETA Productions and the American Library Association as one of 50 public libraries to receive a copy uh, with public um, performance rights to the new Ken Burns 18-hour documentary, The Vietnam War. Um, which will be beginning airing on PBS September 17th. Um, the winners were just announced last week, so I'm really happy to pass that along. And uh, we are excited to participate in a national conversation about one of the most controversial, divisive, and controversial events in American history. And finally, I would like to thank my staff, uh, many of whom changed their schedules and made it possible for the library to be open extra hours on September 1st and 2nd. Um, those, of course, were the special excessive heat days that we had. Um, the, on Friday, those um, being open from noon to 2 o'clock, uh, we had about 50 people in the library, and Saturday there were about 75. So, okay, very you. good. Uh, I was over there. It was working well. Uh, and uh, thank you to Public Works. They were terrific in keeping the air conditioning going this year. <laughs> okay. Uh, Can I ask a question? Do you um, propose to do any special events in conjunction with the Ken Burns? That is part of um, the grant that we got to receive this. We're finalizing now exactly what we will be doing. Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Koberstein? Nothing. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth? I was just going to mention that uh, the City Council is going to go to the League of California Cities meeting in Sacramento for the next from Wednesday to Friday, and there's a magazine that the, the League of California Cities puts out called Western City Magazine, and I think it's really, the more I look at it, it's a terrific way for people to understand how, how many different cities operate. I made some printouts, things about how water plants work and um, uh, managing larger trucks, things that we're dealing with in St. Helena. When you read this magazine, you see other communities are dealing with it too and it's it's pretty helpful so I, I just wanted to say that it's called Western City Magazine and you can get it you can go online and find it and it's through the California League of Cities and that's the meeting we're going to so uh, anyway I encourage people to look at that all right thank you very much uh, Mr. Doring uh, Mr. White no uh, the only thing I would add is to again express my sincere thanks to the uh, library staff for having those extra hours to help cool down our residents on what were very hot days and I did go over and the air conditioning was working well thank goodness so thanks to Public Works too all right uh, that takes us to our proclamation uh, and uh, Ms. Cryden and Ms. Dixon oh okay So turn it around a little bit this way. So yeah, come on. Come on up here. Huh? All right. And the uh, proclamation is for National Latino Heritage Month, uh, September 15th through October 15th. Whereas we celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month, observed in Napa Valley as Latino Heritage Month, whose roots go back to 1968, by celebrating the rich cultural traditions 
and honoring the significant achievements and contributions made by Latino Americans to the United States. Whereas Latinos are the largest ethnic minority group in the country and refers to South or Central Americans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, or other Spanish culture or origin regardless of race, Whereas the cultural, educational, and political influences of Latinos in St. Helena can be seen and appreciated in all aspects of our life, as Latinos continue to be crucial to the cultural, economic, and political growth of our community, and whereas the respective backgrounds of Latino Americans and their dedication to family and community values are an integral part of St. Helena, with a commitment to faith, hard work, integrity, and service, Latino St. Helenians embrace the ideals upon which our city was founded. Whereas this month includes the anniversaries of independence for Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Chile, Belize, and Mexico. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, and members of the Council do hereby proclaim September 15th, October 15th, 2017 as Latino Heritage Month in St. Helena. We call on the people of St. Helena to share in this special annual tribute by learning and celebrating the achievements of Latino Americans and recognizing their contributions to our city and nation. Alan Galbraith, Mayor. Thank you. Would either of you like to speak? I put her on the spot. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me again. I'm Mari Martinez, one of your awesome librarians at the San Helena Public Library. We are very proud of the library to join the celebration of the Latino Heritage Month and to be part of the celebration of the contributions of Latinos in the Napa Valley, especially here in San Helena, our community. I'm a very proud Latina, and I'm very proud of the many things that we do for this community. The library is also very excited to present a series of programs this month, and as you heard, it's a weird celebration because it's between September 15th through October 15th, so it's actually two months of partying. So we began with um, the art exhibition. We have a, a reception night every month, but the art is up in the gallery for the entire month of September with art of Latino, young Latinos in the Napa Valley. I invite you to come and see the wonderful art in our wall. Um, following up, we are going to have a presentation by a local scholar, Sandy Nichols. She has written several books about the history of Latinos in the Napa Valley, especially about the Bracero program. She would be in, in San Helena on Wednesday 20th. The first present is a two-part series presentation. The first one would be at the Rianda House at 3 p.m., and the second part will finalize at the library. So they're very different presentations. So um, you, we begin at the Rianda House and we close at the library. And then on September 28th, the last Thursday of the month, we're going to have a Ballet Folklorico presentation. And it's a little bit different of what we have seen of Ballet Folklorico before because we're actually going to take a trip of, Me of all the states of Mexico. So we're not gonna, just not going to have the entertainment part, but the educational and the historical part of the dances and which part of Mexico they're from. So that's really cool. And then I'm going to come back next month to talk to you a little bit more about the other programs in October because I'll take the entire meeting. <laughs> Thank you so much. And with me, I have Blanca Dixon. She works with the Out Valley Family Center um, Centers. Now there are two of them um, here in San Helena. And she does, uh, she does a wonderful work with the immigration program. And I would like you to introduce you to her so she could talk a little bit more about what they do at the Out Valley Family Center here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I wasn't expecting to talk, but, well, <laughs> I'm here and I'm going to talk. Uh, so as uh, Mari, um, Mari was mentioning, I'm the Immigration Program Coordinator for the Out Valley Family Centers. Right now, for this month, we have some events coming up. One of them is the Citizenship Workshop, where it's a workshop <coughs> where um, people that are lawful permanent residents trying to become U.S. citizens, we help them out with the application. We also provide them classes classes and uh, citizenship touring program as well after they get their civic test uh, date to help them out in uh help them out to pass the test and become US citizen. This uh, workshop is going to be on Tuesday um, 
September 19th at 10 a.m. at the Pre St. Helena Presbyterian Church. So if you know of someone who would like to uh, register for this workshop, uh, please post the bus around. And uh, also we have citizenship classes. We have uh, uh, at our center we do more than immigration, of course. What we do, we are the only uh, organization in a valley, um, in the whole Napa County that, that, that does taxes for free. Uh, and that's whole year around for our uh, community as well. We have other programs that I just came from a um, uh, back to school uh, celebration and we talk about a lot of our programs that we have and uh, some of them are like counseling, we have uh, classes for kids from zero to five, uh, exercising classes and a lot of things good things uh, in our uh, center so I invite everyone and if you guys want to volunteer please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, that takes us to the uh, consent calendar. And again, any member of the council or staff or the public could pull an item from consent, in which case we will go through it. Uh, <laughs> The titles are getting longer, so I may abbreviate uh, a few of them, uh, although uh, I think with respect to one, 8.4, I have to read an awful lot uh, required by law, so just bear with me on that one. Uh, <clears throat> 8.1, consideration of proposed approval adopting two resolutions for various reservoir safety assessments, mapping, and on-call engineering services at Bell Canyon Reservoir and St. Helena Lower Reservoir. 8.2, uh, nomination of Christine Coriel, who's uh, in the second row, uh, to the Napa Valley Transportation Authority's Active Transportation Advisory Committee. 8.3, fiscal year 2016-17 fourth quarter finance report, unaudited, and consideration of proposed approval of resolutions, and then uh, three are listed there. I'm, I'm not going to read through those. They're well set out. Uh, eight, well, and then, and then with respect to the CEQA determination, and then there are three more uh, further budget adjustments listed there, too. Uh, 8.4, and here's the one I have to read out uh, in detail. Uh, consideration and proposed approval of a resolution approving the reorganization of personnel positions, roles and responsibilities within Human Resources, Finance, and Public Works Administration, acknowledging and confirming the city's manager's related staffing decisions, and authorizing and approving publicly available pay schedules in accordance with the re requirement of California Code of Regulations Title II, Section 570.5, amend pay schedule for fiscal year 27-2018 to include reorganizational changes of A, adding working title of senior human resources management analyst position to the senior management analyst classification, B, reclassify the water conservation coordinator working title under senior management analyst classification to accounting technician, and C, adding environmental services technician working title to the uh, accounting technician classification. So, uh, at this point, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Vice Mayor White. Yes. Councilor Ellsworth. Yes. Hoverstein. Yes. Doring. Yes. Mayor Galbraith. Yes. Uh, that then takes us to new business. The first item of new business is appeal of denial of the modified hardship agreements received by the city after the application deadline by Cook St. Helena and Cook uh, Tavern. Uh, and I guess Ms. Mitz, uh, you're the person to speak to that initially. Yes. And I do want to read a quick statement by Megan from Cook and Cook Tavern. She did want to be here tonight, and unfortunately she was not able to, so I told her I would read her statement. Um, it states, Dear City Council Members, we would like to apologize for not being able to attend the meeting this evening. We want to be there to address the council in person, but Jude is at the restaurant and Megan is at home with children. This year, to date, our water usage has not increased, but our bill has more than doubled. In our restaurants, we make numerous efforts 
to limit water use, including low flow toilets, tankless water heaters, and flow regulators on every faucet. This modified hardship would make a big difference for us, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Jude Wilmoth and Megan Rounds, Cook St. Helena and Cook Tavern. All right. The appeal that is before you tonight has been presented by Cook and Cook Tavern. Um, Per council regulations, when we established the modified hardship agreement, we had a deadline uh, where all applications needed to be received. The application for Cook and Cook St. Helena did come in after that deadline. According to uh, Cook and Cook St. Helena, they did state that they did place it in the mailbox right outside of their business, and it just did not get to us in time. I have verified the qualifications um, for both of their entities, and they qualify in every respect. And so the appeal to you tonight is to grant them to be um, to extend the modi modified hardship agreement to them under the rest of the council policy. All right. Any um, public comment with respect to this item? Well, I have Miss uh, Manette. Uh, yes, my name is um, Barbara Manette. I'm speaking as an individual, as a resident, and I had a bunch of questions, like 14 questions. So, I don't know if this is the appropriate. I, I wanted. I wasn't sure what was supposed to happen tonight. If there was going to be direction to the city staff, I wanted to maybe um, present my questions, and if anyone had any interest, they could um, incorporate that into the instructions. Or if I should wait for public comment and send them in there, I'm not sure what I should do here. This is with respect to the appeal. Oh no! What am I doing? I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, my apologies. No worries. Okay. Uh, let me close the public comment then uh, with respect to the appeal. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I'll lead off. I would grant the appeal. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, the applicant states there's no reason to disbelieve uh, that the applicant didn't try to comply with the policy, put the uh, paper in the mailbox, and something seems to have gone wrong. And uh, it seems to me that that's an appropriate, uh, as, as strict as I normally am on timelines, because they're important and they're part of the appropriate process here, I would demonstrate uh, some grace given the circumstances. Uh, there was a real good faith effort to comply with our rules. And it's one day or two days late. And it isn't, we have the money uh, uh, also for it as I read the staff report. I, I agree with that. All right. Anybody? I think we're in agreement. Which, is there a motion to grant, grant the appeal? Well, what is our policy with respect to uh, late filings? The policy, how it was written and approved by City Council, was that no applications would be taken after the deadline date, which I believe was June 30th. And this one, did re we did receive it. I believe it was post or it was stamped by city staff, I believe, on July 7th. So it was a few days after the deadline. The mayor may have more information than I do on this particular topic, but so the the from your staff report and from what the mayor just said is is the contention in the on the appeal that that the um, the request for the uh, hardship agreement was mailed on or about June nineteenth, or was it uh, mailed on or about July sixth, which is the postmark date. It, the the appeal is staff um, followed direction from council policy stating we actually physically received it after the deadline. The appeal is asking city council to reconsider because it was received after the deadline. That's that's not my okay. that, that's not my question. My question is: It appeared that you suggested that they had submitted the this hardship uh, a, agreement request well before the deadline. Is that what they're saying? Because it's not yes. clear to me. Yes, that is. Uh, Cook and Cook St. Helena is saying that they did fill out the paperwork on June 19th. They put okay. it in the mailbox on June 19th. We okay. just did not receive it until Okay, that, that's an important uh, point. <laughs> that wasn't in the staff report. And there, I, we have not seen any appeal, and there was no letter. Probably better to have the appeal, before the actual document before us. And I don't know if that came in later. Maybe that did. But that, was there an actual appeal filed? There was an appeal filed with the city okay. clerk's office. All right. Yes, and I did not include yeah. it in the staff report. Yeah. My apologies. I think uh, given the short uh, period of time, I mean, we, we approved this on June 13th. Uh, eligible businesses had to apply by June 30th. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, how were, how were uh, businesses notified uh, of, of the potential to uh, seek a hardship agreement? Just uh, 
All eligible businesses, they were cert sent certified mail a copy of the policy as well as the, as well as the application for the modified hardship agreement. So okay. we, we physically sent it to them certified mail and we received those certified mail certificates back from every business that was eligible. Okay, thank you. I have a comment. Um, I never noticed that we had a June 30th deadline in our um, materials. I did go back and I looked and it was there. We were having a lot of discussion about what uh, benchmark you were setting to determine hardship. Um, personally, I think it was kind of a tight deadline and uh, I have no problem uh, granting the appeal. The second thing I, I want to... Uh, us to focus on and we'll have to focus on it when we adopt new rates is how we actually calculate the subsidy here you know I noted I know that you're talking about how much money is remaining but I, I think we don't really know the subsidy amount until the new rates are adopted because I believe uh, the way this program works is they are paying based on rates uh, based on their bills from last year before the new rates were adopted, and that when we do put new rates into effect, they have to compensate us for the difference between the new rates and the old rates, and it is the subsidy that fills the gap between that and what the adopted 2016 rates, right? So are you just, you're sort of estimating at this point or what? Uh, yes, your methodology is correct. It's on the wastewater base rates only, so it does not apply to the water or the wastewater usage rates. It's strictly wastewater base rates. The maximum $75,000 that was sent from set by council, that would be if, let's say, their base rate for their water meter was at $43 under the old rates. It's now at $870. And if that base rate goes back to 43 that would be the maximum amount. Um, it is not anticipated we're going to hit close to that $75,000 mark, but we had to put some type of parameter in there. That would be the maximum. It definitely is not going to be that high. And with uh, both of their appeals being filed, we'll st we're still well under that $75,000 limit. Okay, thanks. Okay, any further discussion? Yeah. I'll move approval that we accept this appeal. Second. Ms. Black. Oh. Ms. City Clerk. <laughs> Jephopoulos. I'm not sure if I said that right, but I'm in favor of the appeal. <laughs> the words I need to. <laughs> so. Council Member Doring. Yes. Vice Mayor White. Yes. Council Member Ellsworth. Yes. Coverstein. Yes. Mayor Galbraith. Yes. Okay. Ah, that takes us to LAFCO. Presentation and informational update on LAFCO Municipal <laughs> Services Review and Sphere of Influence Update by LAFCO Executive Officer Brendan Freeman uh, to be followed by City Council discussion and direction to staff. Mr. Freeman. Well, thank you, Honorable Mayor and Honorable Council Members. Uh, I do you have a PowerPoint and uh, Ms. Chafopoulos is on top of it. So we're going to work together on this one and uh, move through it relatively quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, please save those for the end and uh, I'll open up the floor for questions afterwards. And so first thing I want to do is recognize your outstanding staff who has been extremely helpful, very responsive and prompt with all of my information requests of which there have been many over the last couple of years. So. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Noah, Erica, April, Cindy, Mark, who's jumped right into this process. Uh, and I also want to thank former city manager Jennifer Phillips and former interim city manager Larry Pennell. And now uh, I'm going to wait until uh, the PowerPoint gets started before I jump in because uh, there's a lot of material and I think the visual will help right. immensely. So I need to remove myself where I can see it. So I'm just give me a second to go over here. Okay, perfect. And so the first thing I will do is give a broad overview of LAFCO. Uh, this will not cover everything, so feel free to ask questions at the end and I'll fill in the gaps. And so LAFCO is the local agency formation commission and each county in California has its own LAFCO. And what LAFCOs are tasked with 
is administering a section of state law that we refer to as CKH. Next slide, please. And what exactly is LAFCO's purpose? It is to promote the logical and orderly development of cities and special districts and to prevent urban sprawl while preserving agricultural and open space lands. Really the aim is to promote the efficient extension of governmental services. Next slide. So a little bit of history that led to the creation of LAFCOs back in the 50s and 60s the post-World War II era, there was immense urban sprawl occurring, which uh, involved families gravitating towards metropolitan areas, and existing cities struggled to keep pace with the population growth and the ever-increasing need for municipal services. And this resulted in the loss of thousands of acres of agricultural land. Uh, good examples are seen all throughout the state, Santa Clara County, Los Angeles County, San Diego County, uh, here in Napa County, we have done a, an admirable job of pr protecting our agricultural and open space lands, but uh, we don't want to take that for granted. So LAFCO uh, <coughs> continues to fight the good fight in that regard. Next slide. So under state law, LAFCOs have quite a few powers and authorities, and most of them are listed here. And the reason I am here today has to do with those last two bullet points, the spheres of influence and municipal service reviews. Next slide. And so here's just a fun little visual. Uh, if you can't read it, it says this side of the line is your sphere of influence, and this side of the line is my sphere of influence. And so whenever a city is going to grow, that inherently means that another agency, it, likely the county, is going to be losing that land. And so it can be very helpful to have a neutral referee of sorts to uh, help resolve some of these boundary disputes. Is that the county with big stick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, could be. Next slide. And so a little bit more about the sphere of influence. So the state of California defines sphere of influence as a plan for the probable physical boundaries and service area of the agency that the sphere applies to. And LAFCO adopts a sphere for every city and special district within its jurisdiction and then updates those spheres on a periodic basis. And we also adopt local policies to help guide our actions with regards to spheres. Next slide. And there are very specific mandated determinations that LAFCO must make as part of every sphere of influence update. Uh, they're listed up above, but uh, don't worry about reading all of those. Essentially, uh, they all relate to uh, identifying present and planned land uses, need for public facilities and services, capacity of the agency to provide services, and identifying any social or economic communities of interest in the area. Next slide. Well, how are the spheres of influence informed? Well, this is where the municipal service review component comes in. And uh, municipal service reviews, MSR for short, are mandated under state law. And they are a prerequisite to the sphere of influence update. And the MSR can be agency specific or it could be service specific. We've done countywide service studies in the past, or it could be region specific. And in this case, we are doing an agency specific MSR on the city of St. Helena. Next slide. The purpose of the MSRs is really to provide more information that informs future <coughs> sphere changes and annexations. And the MSR also uh, is intended to help enhance coordination and understanding amongst affected agencies and effectively uh, the bottom line is we're looking to help coordinate municipal services with land use in a logical and orderly manner. Next slide. So in addition to the sphere of influence determinations, we also are required to make MSR determinations and there are seven specific areas that we need to address. 
And uh, on number seven, uh, la local LAFCOs are given discretion to adopt policies that allow us to look beyond uh, just the, the six specific factors above. And so Napa LAFCO actually has a policy where we look at regional planning goals and policies. So we try to look at spheres and services on a, a larger basis and look outside the box of just what the individual uh, city is providing. Next slide. And so this slide shows a, uh, essentially this is a summary of the MSR determinations. Now in total, the draft municipal service review and sphere update includes 58 MSR determinations, but these are the ones that really rise to the top. And so I'll give you a moment to take a look at some of those. And really uh, what I have taken away from this is that the city has done an admirable job of uh, getting its house in order following a stretch of administrative and financial challenges. Things are certainly on the up and up, but not everything has been addressed yet. So uh, improving the city's outlook is still a work in progress, but uh, significant work has been done in that regard. Next slide. Now, in addition to the recommend, uh, in addition to deter determinations on the city, uh, LAFCO can also make recommendations. Now, these are uh, not, there's no mandate or requirement for the city to respond or to implement, but they're really intended to uh, be conversation starters that ultimately lead to better service efficiencies and perhaps cost saving opportunities. And so uh, a few of our recommendations are above uh, on the slide, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end if, uh, if you have any about these recommendations. Next slide. The draft report does study four uh, individual areas that are outside the city of St. Helena's existing boundary and outside its sphere of influence. And now on the slide, the jurisdictional boundary is shown as the gray filled in land and the sphere of influence is a, uh, it's hard to see on here, but it's a bold black outline that goes around the boundary and the city's current sphere of influence is effectively coterminous with its jurisdictional boundary. Uh, and LAFCO is studying four areas outside the sphere for potential inclusion into the sphere. Uh, and these have been selected primarily based on a request from city staff and also recognizing that the city provides a large number of water uh, connections outside of its existing boundary. Next slide. And so where are we today with the report? Today we have a draft MSR and sphere update which is currently available for public review and comment and the public has until October 13th to submit written comments to LAFCO on the report and LAFCO has not yet discussed this report but we are scheduled to discuss it on October 2nd and we will not act on the report at that time but rather we will uh, consider which areas we may need improvement and ultimately all of the written comments on the draft report will be incorporated into a final report and that final report is slated for LAFCO's December 4th meeting at which time we may take formal action which uh, would involve confirming all of the determinations and potentially taking action on the city's sphere of influence. Next slide. And so with that, uh, that wraps up my presentation, but I am available for any questions or comments that you may have. And I do also want to mention that I've left business cards on the table in the back here. So if anyone would like to follow up with me after they've given this whole process a bit more thought, please feel free to take my card. And the phone line is always open. Thank you. Are there any initial uh, questions of Mr. Freeman before I open the public hearing? Or All right, let me, uh, Mr. Freeman, why don't you take a seat for a moment and uh, let's see whether anybody wishes to comment uh, publicly.
My name is Grace Kistner. I live at 25 San Juan Court. I've spent two days reading the SOI, uh, and I think that we certainly, before the 10th of October, uh, really need to take a hard look at this. There's a lot of information in there that is incorrect. There's a lot of information in there that is old, um, and I think um, I'm redlining some stuff. I've only gotten through, there's 167 pages that I've gone, it's taken me two days to get through 60 some of them. And I think somebody really needs to take a hard look at this, and I don't know how we do this with staff time, but I certainly think we should get some volunteers that have some expertise in some of these areas to look at this report, particularly the SOI. I, the, what he gave, I've also looked at, and, and because of the sphere of influence that they have on us, I really believe that we want to be sure that this report is correct. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Molly Radigan, Deputy County Executive Officer from Napa County. Uh, first, I'd like to thank your City Manager, Mr. Presswich, for sharing the letter with the Council and the public that the County did initially write to the uh, initial draft of the report. And I uh, would like to thank Mr. Freeman for his uh, efforts to review our comments and incorporate those comments into the administrative draft that's before you. Uh, the county will be submitting a second comment letter on the report. In particular, we are still uh, concerned about the discussion of the police and fire mutual aid services that are provided by the city to the county and the acknowledgement of the mutual aid services that are provided by the county to the city. Uh, finally, uh, we would like to point out the recommendation to consider and point out the recommendation and welcome any conversation about considering the consolidation of services. We certainly welcome that conversation to see how both jurisdictions might be able to mutually benefit uh, and enhance the services that we both provide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm Bobby Monette speaking as a resident. Um, so some of the things that I found, and I didn't uh, read it as carefully as um, Ms. Kisner did most likely, but on page 2-10, um, the, the last sentence says, the original minutes are kept in an official minutes binder in a fireproof room. They are updated. They are uploaded to the city's website. There's no mention of the video there, and the video, as to my knowledge, unless I missed it, um, is the official minutes for the meeting. So um, I thought that it should at least be mentioned, unless that's what they're saying. If that's what they're referring to when they're saying it's uploaded to the website, it's not clear. On page two dash twelve, um, do we still have a tree committee? I'm not sure if we do. On page two dash fourteen, the paragraph under table two dash four. Um, why aren't complaints about city services at least category complaints um, retained? I mean, I don't know if that's a question about the report. I, is that true? And if it's true, I just have that question. Why? Um, page 2-15, um, should we include the new volunteer program when we're describing the police department? It wasn't there to my, to, that I didn't see it anyway. Page 2-16, um, isn't the planning director and the community improvement director the same person? That was my understanding, and it's, I, it's not clear you know, and on that at that place that that's the case. Uh, page 3-4, the urban limit line. Um, this is, um, I don't know if you'd want to change anything, or I don't know if we could, but given what we're learning from the Texas floods from Hurricane Harvey, should we consider, not necessarily for this report, but revisiting the urban limit line issue with an eye to maximizing bare water, bare land, absor bare water absorbing land near floodplains? Um, Page 3.5, the McGrath project is eight units, not ten units. Point, uh, page 3.6, 300 new hotel rooms, 88,000 square feet of office space, 75,000 square feet of retail space, and 5,500 new jobs brings to my mind housing, water, and traffic, but that's not my comment. Is this consistent with page 3-13, reduction of greenhouse emissions per capita um, emissions, per capita CO2 emissions, health and safety, traffic at F intersections, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, is there supposed to be internal consistency in the document with respect to that kind of thing? Uh, it didn't seem consistent to me. Uh, just a couple more. Page 321. Uh, oh, no, I'm not going to say that. Page 419. Uh, do these build-out scenarios include hotels? Page 4. 38 and 439, does hotel construction affect fire department and police department services? Is that taken into consideration um, there? 
page 6.3, does this include or should it include um, steps taken in response to the forensics auditor report? That was the finance um, section. And the last one, page 721, through 735, sphere of influence, well, this is sphere of influence, um, area three, that includes Meadowood, no discussion of annexation, and um, didn't include an option to annex Meadowood. I'm not sure if that, that should be in here. I don't know if it has actually no. discussed, but it has come up. So that's just a question. These are all questions, I'm not taking a stand on any of them. No, I appreciate that. And we're, I'm sure we're going to have a discussion as to how we can effectively communicate uh, uh, what, we, what we see uh, back to uh, the LAFCO and perhaps working it through Mr. House. But when I get the council discussion, uh, you raise a good process question that uh, we need to address. And how and how the and and uh, and how the public works in their comments. Uh, obviously, they can be sent directly to LAFCO, but I also think it would be helpful if they were served uh, if they were provided to the city as well. Um, would you like me to send this to you, or, or is it send it to Mr. Hausch, and you oh, can okay. you can send okay. a copy to Mr. Freeman too. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, any further public comment on this? Well, let me uh, close the uh, public uh, comment and invite uh, council comment. It is a very long, complex, dense, wonderfully bureaucratic document. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, there are... Derogatory. No, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of... Uh, it's, it's, it's written the way... It, 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 the goal is to write it, I'm sure, the way when you get into uh, highly, uh, um, into highly uh, uh, high disciplines in medicine or in law, there's a way of writing about it that enhances accuracy but doesn't necessarily enhance uh, general uh, readership uh, enjoyment, uh, if I could put it that way. Uh, uh, and certainly in going through it, uh, uh, I've noticed um, um, uh, factual uh, uh, statements that I don't think are correct. For example, uh, 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 it has uh, uh, us, uh, it has a portion of the land at Belt Canyon within the city limits at one point, and uh, uh, if you look at the map, uh, uh, but elsewhere it says quite properly that it's in the unincorporated county. Things like that uh, need to be caught and fixed. Uh, but there, there, there are, uh, I'm sure all of us, when we get through it, I think we just got this when, uh, late last week, uh, uh, so we have our bedtime reading for sure in Sacramento uh, this week, uh, uh, and uh, my thought my thought uh, would be uh, for for council members uh, and members of the public as they go through it to come up with a numbered lists, uh, 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 and I, hopefully that they're factual uh, uh, and or raise factual questions, and then send them into Mr. Hausch uh, to uh, take a look at. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, 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 I'm certainly more than willing uh, to work with Mr. House if he asked me to to go through these comments as well, uh, 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 and uh, and then put together uh, some document that comes back to the council for its review. Uh, then there's the whole policy side uh, with respect to it, and this one perplexes me because uh, uh, I'm understanding now that the draft that we have. Uh, incorporates to some extent uh, uh, the county comments that were in the letter of August 22. Uh, but uh, it's obviously important to know whether the county at this point is reasonably satisfied. It, it did say it was going to have a further follow-up letter. I think it would be very helpful to us if the county's follow-up letter uh, uh, was in uh, before we were required to send in our comments so we can see what the county has to say, which may be more policy-oriented uh, and uh, cause us to comment further. Uh, the county has certainly a very uh, significant role in LAFCO by virtue of its, uh, by virtue of having two, two of the five seats on the LAFCO board. So its comments are no doubt, quote, influential, end quote. <laughs> so anyway, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, the big stick, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Doring, do you have some thoughts here? Well, I, I want to acknowledge one thing. You know, uh, Mr. Freeman is is sort of the pinball 
uh, gets bounced around a lot between the county and the city, and I don't think folks really recognize the role he plays to try to mediate between county interest and city interest. It goes back and back, and this, this document, this is the first time I've seen this document, but I was certainly, of course, well aware of it. I, I've served on LAFCO back in the uh, early 2000s, and then more recently, a couple months ago, I, I went off. I was on for a, a period of time, and we... Uh, during that period of time, I, I was involved in the reviewing of, the, of Yountville's MSR and SOI. So many of these issues are, are fresh in my mind, and I have a fair amount of knowledge about LAFCO. Um, I could say this, that this document is not ready for prime time. And I think uh, from, a from a policy point of view, I think we, we, <laughs> we really have to have staff, council to get together to decide what, what issues we want to push and what issues we think are uh, dead in the water. And in my view, many of these issues are dead in the water. And, and we just, but there are certain issues that I think we, we can push on. Um, I mean, we, we really don't have our ducks in a row in terms of our general plan, in terms of pre-zoning, in terms of all of the different qualifications that would enable us to move forward in, the, in these areas. Uh, and we can't just do it. We have to be a little bit more surgical in terms of the, the study areas, I, I think, in general. That would be my recommendation. Um, the other thing I would say, just from, from experience and, and, and knowledge about these uh, documents, is that the MSR is, is substantially undervalued. In, in general in Napa County. And we really need to focus more of our time on that. And when those recommendations come into a final report, I think it's incumbent upon the, uh, our staff and the city to look hard and long at those because that's, that's where the, the opportunities for shared facilities and shared services and collaboration arise. And, and for many, many decades, I think that was been sort of put on a shelf and we didn't collaborate. So at, at some point when this document is finalized, I will be asking our staff to summarize for us what the recommendations are and that we can have some policy discussions to, in terms of law enforcement, fire service, and all, all the other services that we mutually provide. I think we need to hone in on that and use that information not only for our own uh, municipality but uh, to... Uh, have discussions with other communities like Yountville and, and Calistoga in particular. Um, I have a question because it, 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 it's intriguing to me, um, and maybe Brandon, you can help me kind of sort through this this one question that um, is a conundrum for me. So one of the, the, the overarching policies, not only on the state level but here in the county, is that we want to preserve ag and open space, and yet. I, ha I see a comment in the, in the county's letter that says, at, as stated on page 7-3, there are 1,500 acres of agricultural park and open space available within the existing MSR boundary. Developments in these areas are not restricted by measures J or P, but are limited by city planning policies. Mm -hmm. The implication there is that, is that, uh, that, that policy to preserve Ag and open space may not uh, may not necessarily apply to ag and open space within the uh, city of Saint Helena, and the, and the reason I say that is I think we we have the county has to be cognizant, and I think this community has to understand that some of the agricultural properties that we have inside the city of Saint Helena are the most valuable properties anywhere, and they are extremely important, and our park and open space is, is equally as valuable. And so I, I, I don't know where that interplay, that where that tension is, where we want to preserve open space, we want to per preserve ag, yet it seems to me the county is suggesting that we, we jeopardize that policy when it's inside the city. Can you speak to that? Well, thank you for the question, Council Member Doring. Uh, very good question, and I, I would have to say uh, my first thought is that the core mission of LAFCO to protect ag and open space resources certainly applies to any land, whether it's unincorporated county or incorporated city properties. However, we have quite a number of policies uh, and directives from the state that guide urban growth and development within incorporated boundaries uh, and away from agricultural and open space uh, lands. And cities are generally the best at providing urban development. It uh, doesn't mean that you can't have 
agriculture and open space within your boundaries as well. Uh, so uh, not really sure what more I can uh, add to that other than it's, there's no easy answer. We certainly recognize you do have quite a number of acreage of, uh, or a large number of acres of ag and open space lands in your existing boundary. Uh, oftentimes LAFCO directives and our own policies can be conflicting. They don't always all work towards one common goal. So that's one of our main challenges is balancing some of those conflicting policies. And I also uh, I want to take a moment and apologize to Ms. Radigan who uh, I had inadvertently omitted a comment in my presentation that uh, an important comment about the draft report and that is that staff is recommending no change to the city's sphere of influence at this time and that's a that's one of the main outcomes of this report so uh, thank you for the question council member Doring I have sort of a follow-up question to that one of the comments of the county is they thought it was curious that on page seven six um, it the four areas were chosen by the staff and it was their view or their belief that um, LAFCO um, should have, uh, based on your criteria, made some recommendations as to the areas to be studied. Can you respond to that? Well, absolutely, Council Member Koberstein. So uh, in internal discussions with uh, Planning Director Hausch and the previous Interim City Manager Larry Pennell, we agreed that uh, it would be appropriate for LAFCO to analyze these areas based on existing services provided by the city of St. Helena uh, and also a geographic proximity to the city's existing boundary. Now, uh, certainly that was not a directive from the city council, but uh, LAFCO staff believed that it was, uh, it was appropriate to at least evaluate these areas and give a cursory review and certainly it's acknowledged that there's a lot more information that could go into the sphere of influence analysis but at a certain point uh, you've got to got to cut the uh, the report off and it's already almost 300 pages well my only observation I tend to agree with council member Doring um, that um, we can correct all the information in here um, but because we it, we're getting killed on the ag criteria uh, because we have it seems to me because we have these huge areas that include a lot of ag land and um, I was hoping there was going to be an opportunity for a more surgical um, suggestion of the sphere of influence or that you might have one yourself but I, I don't know if we're too far down the road for that well, LAFCO staff came up with the recommendation to affirm the sphere with no changes based mainly on our own internal locally adopted policies, which are very much in line with the state's directives to guide urban growth into urban areas. And the majority of the lands in the sphere of influence study areas are designated under the county general plan for agricultural or open space land uses. Now, there are some exceptions. Uh, however, one of the keys to expanding a sphere of influence and then subsequent to that annexation into the city, a piece of that is a collaborative process with the county of Napa. And uh, at this stage, we have no indication that the county and the city have had those conversations about these sphere of influence study areas, and certainly no agreement has been reached. So that may be a next step before some of these areas are ultimately added to the sphere. Just to make a comment, um, I do agree that I think some of the takeaways from this are in the recommendations of things that we look into and the opportunity uh, to collaborate with other communities on issues like law enforcement. We've only discussed that briefly here. I think there was also an important one regarding water and uh, tertiary water. And uh, so I, I agree with what Paula said. I, we can kind of use this uh, maybe to help guide us as we have our goal setting session in October. Um, it raises some important issues um, that may not have been raised uh, in February when we had the goal setting session with the general public. So. 
Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I see some, I was pleased to see an expanded um, study area, especially to the south where uh, all the <clears throat> residential areas, uh, especially around Stice Lane and, and Garden Avenue are all on septic systems. And there's a number of subdivisions to the south of us and then to the east, um, oh, what is the, the subdivision that's up above uh, Meadowood? Um, Madrone Knoll. Madrone Knoll. Oh. Um, all on, uh, you know, outside septic or, or different systems that, that uh, uh, Meadowood is required to provide. But I see to the south of us that there's a possibility of opportunities for tertiary if, if we could hook up um, into our wastewater system once we're in compliance and, and have the capacity to do so, uh, that would, in, I could see, enable us to uh, provide tertiary um, and, and also um, um, by hooking those, uh, those subdivisions up and being able to come up the highway with pipelines that, that we could add to our, our water system. Uh, for irrigation and such. So I think, you know, it may be premature at this point, but I think those kinds of things need to be studied uh, to be able to uh, relieve St. Helena of some of its, of its uh, water pressures and also be able to take care of our wastewater systems. So, and I don't know if there's collaboration with the county over that or whether um, that would trigger uh, some sphere of influence. And I think the surgical part of it, I think it would be easy to bring that down um, closer to the highway. And and the other concern that I have is with, with all the old, um, I mean, most of the septic systems in that area have got to be 50 to 60 years old, that uh, their failing systems and the water table down there is pretty shallow. So it could be a, a study area for seeing whether there's any kind of influence from the septic systems. So, so. <clears throat> my my thoughts are are that uh, first of all, thank you very much for all the work on this. Um, and we've met a, a number of times. I've met with Mr. Freeman, and I think that LAFCO starts to really provide us with a way of looking at at, at regional planning. Uh, it's maybe sort of an intermediary with the, uh, with the county and other communities that we can start these conversations. And I'm glad Ms. Radigan is here too. Uh, this is to me, it's an exciting step into the future where we start to look at how these things might all interact. And I think Peter's comments about sort of a and Mary's about sort of a surgical look at at maybe there's ways that we can come up with something smaller that's doable that can be sort of a test case of working together, um, particularly on things like the tertiary water and uh, uh, something that benefits everybody. Um, anyway, so whether more study needs to go into to refining this, I think it's a, it's a great start of a, of a look at how we can interact, so thank you. Any further council comments? Uh, Mr. Presswich, if you've got insight here as to how, uh, from management perspective, uh, uh, the city can efficiently proceed to further review and evaluate uh, uh, this document and uh, perhaps address uh, uh, some of its recommendations. Sure, Mayor. I um, had an opportunity to, miss, to meet uh, with Mr. Freeman on August 25th, a little over two weeks ago, and learned about the forthcoming Sphere of Influence MSR study and saw an opportunity to make sure the community and the council were aware of um, what that entailed. It's an important process that takes place uh, uh, every five years or is needed, and in our case, it hasn't happened since 2008. So. Uh, both of these documents were last updated in 2008, and uh, were about a decade out uh, from that um, previous those previous documents. Uh, the turnaround time for the public comment is pretty short. Um, 
and I, I know that uh, I can probably find an extra plate. I know he, Mr. Housh has one plate that's already full, but I bet I could find a, an empty plate somewhere in City Hall. Um, but I, I do think that uh, it will be important for the staff to immediately um, receive comments from council members. Uh, it probably would be helpful to have a couple of council members uh, uh, volunteer to assist us in looking at uh, priorities uh, from the council perspective in terms of areas to maybe surgically discuss uh, ideas and communicate those. Uh, there's, if there are areas within the, the writing that need some updating, uh, and I, my understanding is it's been in the works for a while, so there probably are some opportunities to update some of the, the um, figures and facts in the document. Uh, we'll want to do that as quickly as possible. So what I'm anticipating is uh, wanting to bring you a draft of a document with some council involvement at the next council meeting on September 26th. That would provide us an opportunity to review a draft uh, and then have additional time to bring you a final draft on October 12th. That meeting would be one day before the public comment period closes for the LAFCO review. Um, there would be a little time between then and, and December uh, when the LAFCO board will meet. But um, if the council feels that at that point in time that it, there's a need for additional time, it would be appropriate to consider requesting the LAFCO board uh, extend additional time for the city to complete a review of this particular document, mm -hmm. these, uh, the, these combination documents. <coughs> Well, as I said uh, previously, I'm quite happy to work with staff to deal with the technical issues. Uh, I think another council member would be helpful, particularly with respect to the, quote, surgical, end quote, uh, 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 aspect of looking at our sphere of influence, and maybe the vice mayor would volunteer. Or I would like to volunteer Mr. Doring. All right. <laughs> Mr. Doring, you have the most yeah. LAFCO experience. Right. It does. <laughs> I would be happy to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very Thank good. You. So it will be Mr. Doring and myself uh, working with staff. All right. I think we've gone about as far as we can go this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Freeman, for coming up. Appreciate your presentation. Thank, Thank you, you, Brandon. Thanks, Thank you. Brandon. That then takes us to – oh, that takes us to uh, – the PG&E issue 10.3 consideration proposed adoption of a resolution authorizing the city to opt into PG&E streetlight program, uh, and that we have a staff report. And presumably that's uh, ah, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Hello, thank you, member, and uh, er, excuse me, thank you, mayor, and members of council. Um, for those in the room who don't know me, I'm Tobias Barr. I'm a project manager with Public Works. Um, street lighting, as some of you may remember, um, PG&E's had this program available for about a year, and uh, this came around last year, and they only had um, the 4,000 Kelvin rated lights available. So um, recently, they've they've made the 3,000 Kelvin lights available. So I have a presentation here, just going to do a quick review of kind of what's happened, and and uh, get some direction from council. Uh, so the majority of, sh of the street lights in St. Helena are uh, what's known as LS1 street lights. So those are PG&E owned street lights that we pay them for to maintain and to provide. So there's 325 of those, um, and our, our current street lights and um, you know the the legacy street lights are uh, that everyone's probably familiar with is are the high pressure uh, sodium vapor lights uh, and pg &E has recently, you know, starting about a year ago, has made these LS1 uh, LED streetlights available. And the um, those LED streetlights, the, the upgrade is is no charge, and it reduces the, the monthly rate we get charged. So overall, the estimated savings per year for L LS1 streetlights are, you know, close to $4,000, $3,905. Um, also, recently, the California Public Utilities Commission approved a $10 per lamp rebate. So in addition to that, we get a one-time rebate of $3,250. Uh, 
Um, we looked at this last year. Uh, we talked a lot about some of the things that have come out about um, LED street lights, particularly first generation LED street lights that are quite bright and um, some of the studies that have gone on and we um, staff had proposed you know only using the 4,000 Kelvin lights in commercial areas um, and uh, at that time um, City Council was not comfortable with it so we decided to wait um, but due to a clerical error, we had provided pg e with a map of the areas that we were going to recommend to council one way or another. That map ended up in their contractor's hands, and when they came through town, they started doing the work. Um, when, when it was discovered, they stopped the work. So actually, 48 of our lights uh, in, in the commercial areas, maybe you've seen these on Oak Street or Money Way or Railroad Avenue, actually were converted to the 4,000 Kelvin LED street lights. Um, so now that we have the 3,000 Kelvin available, um, we can move forward with uh, doing citywide 3,000 Kelvin, or now that uh, maybe we have a little bit more experience with the 4,000 Kelvin um, LED street lights, maybe we're more comfortable with allowing those in the commercial areas, and that is um, currently staff's recommendation. We want to hear from everybody, and I'll go over um, why that's our recommendation here. Next slide, please. So again, just to just to go over, um, you know, light pollution and, and one of the reasons why we're doing this, we're doing this to save energy, we're doing this to save money, but we're also doing this because the current generation LED street lights that PG&E is using, um, they're certified by the International Dark Sky Association and they greatly reduce this light pollution. So you can see there uh, directly under the light where the, it says the area to be lit, that's the useful light, right? That's the area we want to light, the street, the sidewalk, and everything else is light pollution and also, you know, known as light trespass when it's coming into, into homes and it, you know, can cause glare and things for drivers. Uh, so these LED street lights greatly improve that and that's regardless of the color temperature, whether it's more blue light or more orange and red light. Um, so I just give this as an example so that the LED street lights that PG&E is using are, um, are very efficient at, at only lighting the useful light area and they have very little uh, spill or trespass um, and they greatly reduce uh, light pollution. Next slide, please. Um, this just kind of looks like a mess, but this is actually, there's, there's a pin where every single LS1 street light is in St. Helena. So those are all 325. Uh, you see some different colored ones. Those are just higher wattages. I just wanted to show you real quick, you know, where all these lights are. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to show you uh, kind of the difference between 4,000 Kelvin versus 3,000 Kelvin, you, this is a, a scale of the color correlated temperature, which is known as Kelvin. So you see the 3000 there um, is, is, is more orange light, less white light. And the 4000 Kelvin, uh, which there's not a line there, but you can see, you know, kind of in between, it has probably 15% uh, more white light and, and slightly more blue light. Um, the, the diagram there on the left might be a little easier to see. That's an actual picture of a lamp. So you can see the 4,000 Kelvin lamp and then look down to the 3,000 Kelvin lamp. It's not a huge difference, but um, the 4,000 Kelvin lamp definitely has uh, more white um, and, and blue light. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, we, we did not approve these last year, but they got installed anyway. Um, you know, maybe that was a good thing because it gave us some experience uh, with these lights. Um, staff has observed them. Uh, we haven't had any complaints. Um, our observations of them is, is, you know, that they are very effective and a huge improvement over uh, the previous generation high pressure sodium vapor lights. Um, and we're still finding them appropriate for commercial and public areas that have more nighttime activity because the blue light, um, it does provide some improvements to illumination and the human eye will recognize an object more quickly uh, in blue and white light. Um, so because of that, we are asking council to consider um, using 4,000 Kelvin lights in these commercial areas like on, along Highway 29, Oak Street, Railroad Way, 
the streets down there by Central Valley, um, and um, and then utilizing the 3,000 Calvin lights uh, throughout the rest of the city. Um, I did bring this to the Active Transportation and Sustainability Committee and explained kind of staff's perspective. They were not aware that the LED streets light had been installed and they were not um, aware of any complaints. So they were supportive of um, staff's recommendation uh, with the caveat that, you know, there is no other complaints. So I, I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has any comments or complaints tonight um, about the 4,000 Calvin street lights, LED street lights that were installed um, last year by PG&E by mistake. Um, and I think, do I have one more slide in there? Oh, just a map of, of the areas we had recommended last year for LED street lights. Um, I know Main Street did not get done because they didn't, they didn't get there either. They didn't have their Caltrans encroachment permit or PG&E realized what was going on and stopped the work before they can get there. So really we have uh, Railroad Avenue, that small section of Adams and Library Lane, um, Oak Avenue and Money Way and the, uh, what is it, McCorkle and what is that other one there? Anyhow, and then the area uh, in, in our parking lots there um, down at Crane Park, I believe we're done. Um, so with that, I welcome uh, council direction. Is there any initial council comment before I open up the public hearing? Let me open up the public hearing uh, and... Uh... Uh, my name is Bobby Monette. I'm speaking as a resident and I have... Um, I've been on record with this very same um, information in the past. There's nothing new. Um, but when it was... Uh, brought up before the council last October, I'd spoken to the public works people in Davis, California, regarding the advantages of 3,000 Kelvin rather than 4,000 Kelvin lights. And I presented the material that I'll be presenting tonight to that council. And I have a copy of it. And if you want more, if you want a copy, you can have it. Um, okay, this was um, a statement adopted unanimously at the AMA annual meeting in Chicago on June 14th, 2016. It's about a year ago. Um, comes in response to the new LED street lighting sweeping the country. Um, the AMA statement recommends that outdoor lighting at night, particularly street lighting, should have a color temperature of no greater than 3,000 Kelvin. Color temperature is a measure of the spectral content of light from the source, how much blue, green, yellow, and red there is. Davis has 3,000 Kelvin on main roads and 2,700 in um, neighborhoods. Um, in, okay. Um, an incandescent bulb has a color temperature of 2400 K, which means it contains far less blue and far more yellow and red wavelengths. Before the electric light, we burned wood and candles. This artificial light has a CT of 1800 K, quite yellow, red, and almost no blue. What we have now is different. The new white um, stuff is being studied. It has two problems, according to AMA. The first is discomfort and glare. Because LED light is so concentrated and has high blue content, it can cause severe glare, resulting in pupillary constriction in the eyes. Blue light scatters more in the human eye than the longer wavelength of yellow and red, and sufficient levels can damage the retina. This can cause problems seeing clearly for safe driving or walking at night. The other issue addressed by the AMA statement is the impact on human circadian rhythmicity. Using this rating, two different um, 3,000 K light sources were compared, and actually with just comparing two 3,000 K, they found a difference between those two in the blue light. So 3,000 isn't even necessarily ideal. Um, the AMA policy statement is particularly timely in the, uh, because of the new Atlas of the World Light Pollution. Just, appear, just appeared last week. That's a year ago in June. Okay, um, in the previous, uh, let's see. Normal, okay, in the previous articles, the author of this said that the, uh, he had described new lighting, how lighting affects our normal circadian physiology and how this could lead to some serious health con consequences and most recently how lighting the night affects sleep. 
Um, in the case of white LED light, it is estimated to be five times more effective at suppressing melatonin at night than the high pressure sodium lamps given the same light output. Can I finish? I have yeah, some sure, more, sorry. Right? Um, which have been the mainstay of street lighting for decades. Melanonin suppression is a marker of circadian disruption, which includes disrupted sleep. Bright Electric lighting can also adversely affect wildlife by, for example, disturbing migratory patterns of birds and some aquatic animals. Almost done here. Okay, there's three AMA recommendations. The first is we should do this re replacement to save on fossil fuel, fuel. So they're in favor of doing the LEDs. Second, the AMA encourages minimizing and controlling blue-rich environmental lighting by using the lowest emission of blue light possible to reduce glare. Third, the AMA encourages the use of three thousand or lower lighting for out outdoor installations, such as roadways. All LED lighting should be properly um, hooded, and that, that goes without saying. And I have one more thing. Animals, insects, and birds cannot complain to City Hall about lighting that is disrupting and are harming their lives. Regarding human animals, intuitive perceptions are not always accurate. It is a mistake to base this decision on complaints received by the City. To deprive PG&E's public relations department the opportunity to correct their mistake would be a detriment to them, to St. Helena humans, and all other creatures affected by 4,000 Kelvin streetlights. Please replace the 4,000 Kelvin streetlights with 3,000 or lower. Thank you. And I, again, I can distribute this information to anyone who's interested. Okay, thank you. Any further public comment? Mark Smithers, um, Vallejo Street. I have a little bit of <coughs> jumbled notes here, but uh, I'll try and organize it. I'm all against, I'm all for reducing light pollution. I absolutely agree with that. I think it's terrible. The night sky when you can't even see anything because we have so many, you know, significant lights around town and whatnot. So I'm all for that. But uh, to echo what was just said, I, I do think we have to be careful about the health aspects of it. I know back when this first was brought up, um, <clears throat> the idea of dimming technology and shields was brought up. So I don't know how we're working dimming technology and, and shields into this so that it doesn't, you know, although, yes, you are cutting off the light more, um, when you're in neighborhoods, you're still shining into bedroom lights and that sort of thing, which make it, you know, much harder for people to sleep well. Um, Along the health aspects, you know, so hopefully dimming technology and shielding comes into place, and hopefully, yes, we go to 3,000s versus 4,000s. Um, you know, this kind of reminds me of, like, when asbestos and cigarettes and lead and paint came along, and everybody thought those were all fine and great and fantastic, but then we get years down the road and we realize that that, technology and those chemicals and those things aren't really good. So I think we're kind of in the infancy of really knowing whether or not LED lighting is good or bad for us. Um, so maybe maybe even moving a little more slowly would be right. Um, specifically, the previous public works director agreed that you wouldn't change out the lights at least when we had the council meeting. There's, there's a couple of lights at the Crane Park area, and when you look at the, the diagram, it shows that you're doing all the lights on Crane Park, but there's two lights that are right on South Crane against the neighbors there, and it was agreed that we wouldn't change those out, and I, I'm 99.9% .9 certain they haven't been changed out, although I just heard that maybe they had been, because I know PG&E came and put a shield up, and I think those lights haven't been changed, so I would like to not have them become LED lights. Um, I think the neighbors there would appreciate that. As far as nobody complaining about the 48 lights that were switched out, hearing where they were, it sounds like they're mostly in commercial and not in residential. Right. So I don't know that you had much of an opportunity to hear complaints from anybody. Um, and now you're talking about 325 lights throughout town. Um, so that's, that's a concern also that we're maybe using a false negative there that nobody complained about them. So then therefore, let's just go ahead and do the rest of town in LED lights. Um, so I guess those are all my comments. All right. Hopefully Thank you very much. Take Mr. those Spinner. into consideration when you okay. come up with a final final. All right, good. Uh, just, just one question on the two lights that you mentioned. Um, 
what is the issue there? The two lights that you don't want to have There's change out? There's two lights um, right on at the end of Crane Park. One is, well, they're both on South Crane. And the given the health concerns and there's, I mean, I, I think, in fact, I did it very late. I sent you guys an article, everybody an article on, on the health concerns with regards to LED lights and it has a lot to do with whether it's red light or blue light or green light or white light or all that stuff that the, we wouldn't change those out <laughs> because of the health concerns that the neighbors do have there. Um, and they're right on top of residential spaces versus further into Crane Park or on, you know, in commercial areas like the industrial area off of Dowdell and that sort of thing where nobody is sleeping and nobody's living. They're, you know, they're, they're usually the lights aren't on during the day unless it's a really, really foggy, dark day. I guess presumably uh, other neighbors can come forward and say, I don't want these here, I don't want those there. I, I, I hate to have that unintended consequences. Are, are the, well, I guess the lights that I you guess, have... I, I guess that's something to consider, Paul. I mean, if the neighbors are concerned about their health and, and the effects of them and the neighborhood, LED lights, to save $4,000 a year, I would think maybe, I don't know, I'd, my, my mother-in-law died from asbestos because they didn't know that it was a bad thing back in the day and she ended up working in areas where they had asbestos and she ended up having so i just i would suggest that maybe it would be helpful for the council and the city to consider i think significant health concerns that are realistic of the neighbors okay. I, I agree with you i just i think uh, there has to be some context uh placed in terms of our decision making process i think i appreciate your comments and bobby's also we stopped the process back in October because precisely for the reason you're talking about, and I was one of the ones who advocated for not having 4,000 yeah. Kelvin precisely because of my concerns about health and, and animals. And I, I don't think that's been mentioned. We, we, we've responded to the community. That's why we didn't go forward inadvertently. pg and &E went forward with 48 of them, unfortunately. So I, I think it's important to, to note that this council has responded to that issue. And I, I think you're saying that may, you don't want to see an LED light in these two areas at all. And I, I was just I trying to explore that further having, issue. I okay. would propose not having LED lights in any neighborhoods at all. Okay. I absolutely oh, would. Okay. Well, because we don't know we, we don't know the health ramifications of it. And it's going to save us $4,000 a year. Okay, I mean, very good. Thank enough. you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, any further public comment? Can I comment on this issue? Sure. <laughs> Come on up to the. Uh, so, as for the debate in color temperature. Wait, wait, wait get, get up to the microphone and state your name. Uh, my name is Aaron Starr. I'm the right. um, tech for filming this meeting. So um, as for color temperature, 3,000 versus 4,000, like I feel like we're kind of debating minutia because daylight is like 5,500 and up. So to say that it's harmful at 4,000 is kind of silly because that's less than daylight. Um, now to have... Daylight's infrared. Just huh? Wait, wait. wait. Infrared. Well, please, daylight like, is ultraviolet. Yeah, please, please talk to me. And, 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 and Yeah, anyways... Um, then also, just like, there are some environmental ramifications. I don't know how it affects birds, but I know that plants, if they have bright light on them at nighttime, it interrupts their carbon cycle and they don't produce as well. Uh, I don't think that's, like, going to be a major issue, though, because this is, you know, really not that much light that we're talking about. So um, I don't know about birds, but I don't think it's uh, any, if, if anything, it's more safe to have brighter light because um, the human eye needs light to see, and the brighter the light is, the better you can see, up to a point, obviously. But um, the closer to daylight, the better, in my opinion. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Any further public comment? All right. Uh, let me close the public comment. Mr. Barr, can I ask you a question? Certainly. Uh, first of all, can you address the dimming shields issue? This is refreshed my memory that we had some discussion of that uh, last right, fall. Right. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I'm very familiar with, with what they've done in Davis. I used to live in Davis. I um, know the person who ran that program, Mitch Sears, um, and they, they did kind of have a disaster. They had, um, it's kind of a long story, but they had some 
uh, contractors put in some very bright lights in that town, and it was it was very disruptive, and, and they fixed it, but it cost them a lot of money. Um, but there is no dimming available on the PG&E LS1 lights. They they do not offer it. Um, it's something that has to be. It's you know something else that has to be maintained. That sensor has to be maintained. Um, typically, the um, the way the dimming lights are also going is they're all networked together. So it's it's just um, not something that PG&E is offering. It's it's kind of a very specialty application, typically like college campuses along paths or through parks. So it might you know might be something we can look at um, for some of our owned lighting. Um, but on, on for sh LS1 lighting, it's just not available. The shielding, shielding however, is available. Um, we can ask them to put in shielding, and they will, they will do it. They'll either put it in when it's installed, or if, if we have a problem, uh, we can ask them to come back out. I, I think there's a small fee, a couple hundred dollars, um, but they will come out and shield the light however we want them to. Okay, good. And do you remember any uh, discussion uh, about the two lights on South Crane that Mr. Smithers brought up uh, from the prior meeting? I have some memory that that did come up. Right, right. And I don't think the one uh, on, on Mr. Smithers' intersection there um, actually got done. So, um, but I will say it is my opinion I've seen that light, and that is a terrible um, sodium vapor light that is very bright and disruptive. And I would, um, I, I, it was my opinion that a 3,000 Kelvin LED light would be an enormous improvement um, to the ambiance in that area. All right. Thank you. Any further questions of Mr. Barr? I have a question. It's it's unclear to me how often you get to opt into this program. I mean, is this a decision we need to be making now, or do we have another opportunity in another year, or what? What's the story with that? Well, they're um, they're in the area right now, so and this is uh, I believe this program is ending in a year as well. So we might be able to kick the can down the road a little bit, but unless CPUC reapproves the program, I'm not sure what, what will happen. So are they you, may are only, you saying They may only we, replace them when the lights fail, and then they'll just replace it to an LED light. So um, if we don't opt in within whatever the time frame is that they're offering this program, then they would only come in and do selective replacements right, with yeah, the same light fixture that was there? That's correct. No, uh, All right. Uh, any further questions, Mr. Barr? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's amazing how a program like this can have such complexities uh, to it. There's no... <laughs> Uh, you know, I thought we had a very good discussion last fall that we went for the 3,000 Kelvin. I think a good argument can be made for the 4,000 Kelvin in the commercial areas. I'm a little worried that 3,000 may not be enough light. But on the other hand, I must say the uh, AMA recommendations are quite persuasive with me. And so my instinct, subject to hearing from my colleagues, is to go with the 3,000 through the city. I would agree with that. I think um, that's compelling, the AMA recommendation, and um, I don't know that I want to kick the can down the road again and, and lose out on um, being able to change these out with no cost to the city. My thought is I tend to agree with Ms. Monette and Mr. Smithers. I feel like if the AMA says they recommend the max to be at 3,000, and if we stay with our current lights at 2,400, then we're then we're under the max. I think the point that we just don't know yet what these do uh, in terms of disruption to humans, animals, insects, birds, and and plant life, um, giving it time to to at, you know like asbestos, secondhand cigarette smoke, or lead and paint. Everybody thought at the time it was fine. Um, so, so if we don't lose anything but uh, three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars a year, um, I feel like we should just stay with what we've got with the vapor sodium, except maybe on the tennis courts, find some lower uh, vapor sodium. Uh, 
But I, 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 I feel like if the current lights are less disruptive and we know more about how they work, I, I'm, I'm for staying with, staying away from the LED. That's where I'm at. Well, it, <laughs> you said that you agreed with uh, Bobby and you also agreed with Mr. Mr. Smithers and they are diametrically opposed in terms of their recommendations. Well, well I guess I meant in terms of the impacts on, on animals and things like that. Oh, okay. I, I, I tend to kind of agree with the mayor that it, it's a reasonable compromise at, at 3000 for the entire city and not the 4000 I am... You know, I have young children at home, and I think people don't realize, you know, we are all, and, and whatever, we have our families, we have people we know, we, we are all, all cognizant of health, and I, I am very cognizant of, especially my children's health, and everyone's health in the city, so it's, it, to me, it's the 4,000s, you know, were very, very bothersome, and the fact that pg e was sort of pushing that on us, and they really pushed that on Calistoga, and Calistoga ended up, uh, uh, taking the bait. I, uh, there's not a, another way to say that, but they installed 4,000 uh, and I think we held off. I tried to get them to, you know, support us. They decided to go on their own way with the 4,000. I think the 3,000 is a reasonable compromise. I, um, I am concerned, of course, about LEDs and, you know, this whole thing about uh, asbestosis and all these things. Yeah, that, that bothers me a little bit. Um, uh, I'm not going to discount that as a risk. There's, there's a risk here. Uh, the AMA is is recommending three thousand, and I'm comfortable with that um, with that recommendation at this point. Okay. Ms. Carver-Staten. Well, I I do have some concerns about just jumping into this program. We have very small areas of the town right now that are illuminated by the four thousands, and uh, I got to believe that once you populate this map with uh, LED lights, we're going to hear from a lot more people in residential areas. Uh, and I would point out that along Oak Avenue there, uh, we've got residents between Mitchell and um, Spring. Um, you know, I'm wondering if we can't have some pilot program or some test um, lamps installed in so that people can actually appreciate the difference uh, at nighttime. Uh, I fear that we're going to go into a program and we let, although we like to think that people are always watching us on TV and paying attention to everything we're talking about, um, we could have, you know, a massive outcry when the installations uh, take place. So it's kind of why I was asking about the timing and if it's necessary um, to do this um, <clears throat> this evening. Well, I, I had one other comment too, and it, it's about complaints. You know, if back in the day when somebody painted a, a house with lead paint, n nobody would have known to complain. And I think the impacts were very subtle that the uh, 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 um, built over time. So somebody may not realize there's a problem while they're being affected by it, and and how it affects domestic animals, how it affects birds, how it affects insects, which are all part of the chain, um, people might not know because it's such a subtle impact. So anyway, I just think that that's, that's a consideration that, that uh, we don't know. Well, I'm, I must say that I'm concerned about putting the decision off because, uh, as uh, has been explained, uh, this is a program that's approved by the, by the uh, California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, there's no assurance that it's going to continue that program, uh, and at this point, uh, it can be done at no cost to the city. And uh, other cities are certainly moving uh, in this uh, direction. So, uh, what, what is the current uh, the expiration of the program? I'm not aware of that exact date, but I, I was informed by PG&E that it will be ending in within the year, I believe. You know, the, the city of Napa certainly has gone to LEDs, uh, and as far as I know, there have been no serious complaints in the city of Napa. Well, would hurt, just to continue the discussion, yeah. I mean, um, populating these lights all over our residential areas, is the thought there that it's primarily needed for traffic safety reasons? Um, 
you know, you mentioned you liked the 4,000 in the commercial area because it was better viewing. I mean, what is the thought when it comes to the residential areas? Are we doing this so that people who are driving on our streets can see, you know, people on the sidewalks? Or are we doing it for general safety of the residents um, so that their yards are lit up and whatever? I mean, what, what, what's driving this? Uh, you know, I, this? I could let the public's work director maybe speak a little <laughs> bit more about, about public lighting and, and the things that drive that. There, there's complex lighting studies uh, that, that can be done. And, you know, if we got into um, looking at that, we might need to do some of those studies? Well, if you brought up the, the, the one slide again that showed the light pollution. So the sodium vapor shows that all that light pollution around. The LED shines down on the street where we're trying to provide the defensible space, cars, pedestrians, wildlife running across the streets or, or domestic animals that are outside their yards. But um, it's, it's just trying to prevent that light pollution that goes on in the neighborhoods now. You can't look up at the sky and see the stars. You're, you're focusing that street light on what it's supposed to be doing, which is illuminating the street and not everyone's life. Yeah, is it possible to get that up, back up? or? And um, I, I've been on peripheral of this because Petaluma started this program. They started. They have to pay. They own the streetlights in most of the um, city of Petaluma. And we started down this path, I want to say, five years ago. And we have to pay through a loan, through a PG&E loan, to replace um, the LED retrofits. And they're continuing that program. They've been doing it for at least five years, I believe, now. Um, so... It's, it's, and I'm not sure if it was 4,000 Kelvin. I had to put some of those on my, pro, um, on some of my safety improvement projects just as, because we were starting to change out all the lights as we, we progressed on uh, capital improvement projects through downtown. Um, but if you see the, the, the light pollution here, the radiant light should really be that area that's lit down at the street level and not all that out, I uh, call light trep pass as it goes up and, and interferes with the night sky. And it's not unlike some, you know, uh, park lights, as, as Smithers has commented before, where, where like the Musco lights, they really just shine straight down the ball fields and they don't do light pollutions around you and the shielding on. We, they, there is some shields, but um, <coughs> on, on park lights, I'm, I'm not going to try it, um, it but, but that's the purpose of the LED lights is to just illuminate what's supposed to be illuminated, not everything around it. So we're sort of weighing light pollution versus health issues. In one respect, is that right? Well, I mean, uh, is that the driving thing to do? It is the the night light issue. Well, I uh, on the <coughs> the it is it is a, an enormous improvement to light pollution. I will say that um, on the health pollution side, you know, I would be cautioned to jump to conclusions. I think um, the AMA study. Uh, certainly raised some red flags. They looked at very dense urban areas with a lot of lights. They were looking at these areas that um, converted to, uh, you know, first-generation LED lights that, you know, when they were coming out, the International Dark Sky Association and others weren't certifying them, um, so they didn't meet the same standards. Um, so, uh, you know, I would hate to jump to conclusions on 3,000 Kelvin lights. I, I think there's very limited data um, in terms of, of how the lower color temperature uh, LEDs impact health. <coughs> um, I, I think it's more clear on the brighter temperatures. So they looked at a lot of 5,000 and up lights. Um, a lot of the roadway lights and bridge lighting is like 550, and that's where they would see um, you know, it impacting spawning fish. Or in Hawaii, they, they cited an example in Hawaii where they had very bright lights on the beaches, you know, 550, 550, or excuse me, 5,500K, 5,000K, that was confusing hatch, hatchling turtles. You know, they would, they would confuse it for the glimmer of the ocean and go the wrong way. Um, so those kind of issues were, were um, certainly very serious. Um, but that, the data for, for the 3,000K, I think, is there's not that much data right now. And... Um, you know, there may there may be a risk, but I think it's greatly reduced from the brighter white and blue light because it's it's just not there. There's very little white and blue light in 3,000 Kelvin. And if you you can go back to that other slide that shows what 3,000 Kelvin is. Um, one more. Well, it seems to be in the same range as 27 to 3,000. 
I mean, it, it's very, very as close. far as what it's, it's very, very what it's good for. Right. You know, it's. Um, and keep in mind, it's you know plus or minus a couple hundred k, is what the ratings say. Okay, and where? Um, how do our current lights compare in terms of their utility? You know, the things that are mentioned here. Um, yeah, they're obviously around, they're they around have 25 a to 2700. And, and again, they spill that light everywhere, right? They create a lot of light pollution. It's most of the light, the wattage that is put out of that light, uh, a very small proportion actually goes to light the street because it's lighting so much other area. Do we get complaints from residents about the issue you showed, like the light that's going into somebody's house? With our current street lights, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not aware of those. I know that I, when I'm looking around town, I know some of them are shielded. So I'm assuming that there's been complaints, and we've had to call PG and ask them to shield them. Okay. And is there some measurement, actual measurement of our current light pollution now? No, I, I, I mean I walk out my door and I see the night sky every night. Um, I mean, I must say I find our streets to be very dark. Uh, uh, walking up and down Adams Street uh, or walking uh, around on Hudson Avenue as I do, uh, it's very hard to see the curb uh, with these current lights. Uh, so, to my, and, and I quite frankly don't like the current lights, never have. I've got one in front of my house and uh, it lights right up into the into the oak tree uh, as much as it goes down into the uh, into the street. Uh, it's uh, landscape lighting. Uh, yeah, right. It, it, indeed, uh, indeed, I couldn't believe it, but the oak tree obviously didn't like that light because it broke off the sensor uh, a year ago. pg and &E had to come and replace it. I didn't believe an oak tree could do that, but it did. <laughs> well, I, is there any further council discussion at this point? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, let me see whether there's a motion to go for the 3,000 Kelvin uh, lights uh, based upon the discussion. I would move to um, have the 3,000 um, throughout throughout the city. All right. And Does that mean the re replacement of the fours? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I just interject that that would also include the adoption of the CEQA finding recommended in the staff report. Yeah. So moved. Second. All right. There's a motion, a second. Ms. Black. Oh. Sorry about that, City Clerk. I'm still getting used to it myself. All right. <laughs> Vice Mayor White. Yes. Councilmember Doring. Yes. Ellsworth. No. Coberstein. I'm going to vote no. I think it's premature. I, th I feel that we're being pushed to make the decision, and a little more analysis would be helpful. Mayor Galbraith. Yes. Okay. Uh, that takes us to 10.4, uh, which is our civic facilities needs assessment. Uh, uh, and uh, let me turn to the city manager to lead off the discussion. Thank you, Mayor. The Council uh, Subcommittee of Council Member Doring and Council Member Koberstein have worked recently on the development of the needs assessment with city staff. That RFP is now on the city website. We're anticipating responses by October 2nd. And in the context of those discussions, um, the subcommittee has been prompted to consider the idea of aligning that effort with a rigorous public engagement process. And so I understand tonight uh, Council Member Doring may have some initial comments on some of that thinking, and I'm happy to walk through additional detail. Well, I'm glad you're going to walk through the additional detail. Um, I just have very brief comments. Mary and I have been meeting on a regular basis, uh, both together and also with our staff, to uh, discuss these various issues. As you know, right now we're in the information gathering mode with, uh, to 
get a better understanding of what our actual needs are. And so we have this RFP that's pending, and hopefully we'll get some good responses. Uh, but we also recognize that once we gather this information, we're going to need a whole lot of public engagement to figure out what we do with this information, how best to use it uh, in terms of meeting uh, the goals that, that arise from the needs assessment. And so uh, Mark uh, will probably lay out a little bit more of the detail of, of what we've been discussing. But essentially, we're discussing a, a dual process where we have where we uh, appoint a, an ad hoc committee to receive and, and interact with uh, uh, the, the assessment itself, the needs assessment, but also uh, help develop strategies, uh, particularly financial strategies, uh, that uh, get us to achieving our goals and, and the recommendations that arise out of the assessment itself. So Mary and I have discussed the potential for having an ad hoc, uh, a standing committee, an ad hoc committee, uh, between seven and nine members. Uh, we, uh, as a subcommittee, would be um, volunteering our efforts to sort of screen and the, those uh, applicants, interview those applicants, and present a, uh, a recommended, recommendation as to a slate so that the council can look at the entire group as a whole. Um, you know, these folks would have to be available basically starting in uh, December, and there are going to be a number of meetings, I assume, between December uh, and, you know, late March. And so we want folks who are, who are uh, available. The reason I think the ad hoc, uh, this, this committee approach is, 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 a, is a strong approach is that we have so many, so many uh, resources in our community in terms of human resources. We have a lot of folks who are very knowledgeable in the areas that will be discussed. And so I think that is a really, really uh, fantastic way to go. And I, I think based on experience, our ad hoc committees have generally worked well in this community. But at the same time, we have to uh, recognize that there's got to be broader uh, outreach, and so we're also suggesting um, you know, a public engagement process that would include uh, uh, town halls, workshops, tours of, of city facilities, and those kinds of things. Um, so that's what we've been thinking about. It's a check-in point as a subcommittee to get uh, consensus on the council, and, and so that's that's what we're suggesting tonight, and Mary may have other uh, other uh, ideas that I missed. Well, I think the purpose of talking about this tonight is also to get reaction from the community. Um, you know, we hear a lot about how they want to participate and, um, you know, what they find helpful and useful. Um, I do think it's important at some point that this process open up to a much larger group of residents, uh, you know, who are maybe being led through some exercise of imagine, you know, here's what we need to do. Now you work with us and imagine how we're going to do it. Um, so, you know, we're for people who are here and want to address it, I think we'd, we would like to hear what you think uh, uh, should occur as far as citizen review uh, of this document. I do want to mention one thing kind of unrelated that was mentioned to me today that there some concern has been expressed that we aren't um, evaluating all of the uh, city assets through this RFP um, such as these property up around the reservoir <clears throat> but if, if my memory serves me correctly we did discuss that but it really wasn't appropriate within the context of the RFP that it is something that we could accomplish in another um, fashion. Um, so we haven't forgotten about it. Um, what we wanted to do was uh, focus on what our capital improvement needs are in this study and, and how we could address them. I don't think we're discounting that there may be revenue sources somewhere and somewhere along the line we'll address that. Well, uh, I think with respect to that, it was pointed out that the uh, property around the reservoir belongs to the water enterprise, uh, and so it would really need to be evaluated in the context if parcels could be sold there as to how that would be used to uh, perhaps uh, offset uh, future rate increases dealing with the water enterprise. This is a bit of a different exercise, as I understand it. We're trying to figure out how we uh, deal with general fund uh, facilities uh, and uh, and uh, the the, the uh, rehabilitation of, um, of of significant facilities, 
uh, as well as perhaps the replacement of some facilities like City Hall. So there's a different different subject matter as I see it. All right. Uh, so, Mayor, it may, it may be helpful for me to sort of walk through some of the ideas, and I think the first observation is um, the city manager doesn't have 2010 vision, and uh, clearly that's very difficult to read, <laughs> and, I'm and I'm afraid I don't have a Zoom button. So the easier thing to do may be to follow in the agenda report. So just um, the, to reiterate, the focus of tonight's discussion and, it, and the subcommittee's recommendation is really a check-in with the community as well as the council to receive feedback on the concept of is, it, is there value in considering a comprehensive public engagement process that would complement the needs assessment that will begin soon. And so what uh, we've done in working with this committee is to identify a conceptual timeline for first the needs assessment consultant. So that's the left column here. And we've identified months um, by which we think certain deliverables will take place. We are it's a, it's a rigorous schedule. We are anticipating, as we indicated at the prior meeting, of receiving a draft report by the end of December and then uh, a final report by the end of January. So an aggressive timeline. But that obviously presents an opportunity to engage the community. And we have two forms of complementary, uh, essentially concurrent public engagement uh, envisioned. One would be a council-appointed citizens committee. This is the, the ad hoc reference that Councilmember Doreen indicated. And that uh, committee could really get started now. Uh, we could begin that recruitment in short order and have a, a citizens committee. The idea is uh, seven to nine members reflecting uh, a number of you know really different perspectives on a variety of issues within the city. So uh, a broad-based community citizens committee. And then they would be tasked with a number of activities. They would receive briefings on the city budget, the city fees, those balances, the use of those fees. They would participate in uh, city tours. We anticipate, frankly, that the consultant for the needs assessment, obviously, they're going to be taking a look at all of those assets. Uh, but certainly, the public, both the citizens committee and members of the public, we be. I think it's actually advantageous to see some of the the buildings up close and personal. Um, we discovered some melting uh, plastic on a, on a live wire in City Hall uh, about a week ago. Uh, it's opening up those buildings to the city public and the community to really see what they look like inside. Um, and then to also be engaged in the DAFT assessment findings. So as that assessment unfolds, we see opportunities to link a citizens committee with the unfolding results. At the same time, and concurrently, uh, through workshops, through focus groups potentially, uh, through tours, we see an opportunity to engage the, com the larger community as well, uh, including perhaps near the end of that process an open comment period where the community would be invited to not only participate in these other activities, but present their own thinking on um, the ideas that, are, that uh, are being considered by the Citizens Committee, with uh, the final idea that the committee provide a number of alternatives and information back to the City Council for consideration. So while I've d identified this as an information analysis and decision-making phase, it's also probably appropriate to consider it th the entire process and information gathering effort. And so tonight we're looking for feedback on these ideas. All right. Uh, let me open it up for public comment. Uh, any public comment at all? Yeah, um, I, I'm Bobby Monette again, speaking as a resident. Raw, raw. I think this is wonderful. Um, and it's, 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 it's like, um, you know, we talk about doing it, but this is a real um, plan to get it done and, you know, to, to implement and see how it works. And I think it's really, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I speak for anyone else in the community, but I think it's a, um, 
one of the first times that I've seen such a complete um, process described for ongoing public um, participation, not just the committee, but other aspects, other avenues for people who don't have the time or don't have the um, um, whatever, the in inclination to be on the committee, they can participate in other ways as well. So I, I think it looks great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any further public comment? My name is Grace Kistner. Um, I kind of looked at the plan this afternoon. I really like the plan. Uh, I think it engages a lot of people, and I think it's time that we're more transparent with what we do, and I think that's a great plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just sort of ended up hanging around, so um, I actually have a comment. Mark Smithers, Vallejo Street. I don't know. I, I always hear that it always seems like we need to own our facilities, and I just I've driven by it a few times, and I I had an aha moment the other day. I don't know if the city's ever considered, but there is the building like south of the car wash where Constellation Brands is. And I don't know if the city's ever considered. I mean, renting that for city hall and other purposes. Plus, it's also close to the public works you know area. And I mean, I don't know that we have to build and always own our you know city hall and whatnot i just it's there it's available i think it's one of those buildings that's probably hard to lease out because it's, it's you know larger building in town and so i don't know i don't know if that's something you have ever considered and mark you might not know this but those those exposed live wires in city hall that's pest control that's that just <laughs> so you <laughs> It's uh, on behalf of the staff it, that pest control process is not working currently. <laughs> uh, Tim Neiman, uh, St. Helena. Um, based on previous comments I've made over the last few months, I don't think anybody will be surprised that I'm uh, hugely in favor of what you're proposing here. The decisions that are related to this study are huge for the city. They're, they're huge for the long-term viability of the city functioning. And the public is extremely engaged in what this will do to the uh, kind of the long-term look of the city. So I think more public engagement is important here. I think the two-pronged approach is perfect. So uh, keep going. This is great. All right. Well, I can see one member of this committee right now. <laughs> I see two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, would, I would just like to say that um, we have these meetings with Mark, and Paul and I do a lot of talking, and Mark uh, does a lot of organizing, and uh, he gets the credit for uh, Oh, come pulling on. this all together. <laughs> this is true. And, uh, this I, is true. I suspect we're going to see more of this kind of thing, which is good. Um, I'm wondering myself if, you know, if we're going to, if we hope to appoint committee members, uh, in October and and put them to work uh, should we consider uh, getting an announcement out uh, not in October but sooner um, and maybe you know in this case give people some idea of when the time is they're going to be meeting and and how often um, so that people can consider you know whether they want to apply for this ad hoc committee if the council you know, thinks the ad hoc idea is a good one. Well, I certainly think the ad hoc uh, is a very good idea. I like the idea of the subcommittee presenting a slate to the council. Uh, 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 and on that point, you're, uh, Mr. Mayor, I elected, uh, I neglected to uh, maybe in my statements uh, clarify that, uh, you know, the mayor is uh, has the final appointment under state law, and I wasn't uh, intending to usurp that power. It would be a recommendation to the mayor no, uh, and the council. No, I understand okay. that, but we've got a subcommittee of the council that's making a recommendation, and uh, it's without uh, saying what I would do, it's certainly unlikely that I'm going to disagree with the recommendation of the subcommittee. That's the way we have it. Uh, now, the, the, I think we should uh, uh, think about what the size of the subcommittee is, the uh, seven or nine. I, on the uh, last water and wastewater uh, uh, ad hoc committee, do we have seven? Yes. Uh, I, you know, my instinct tells me seven is a little more manageable than nine in terms of a committee, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe seven plus two alternates. That gets you to the nine because we know from any of these committees that meet uh, that meet uh, 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 with some frequency that that 
and you have able residents on them, uh, that there are going to be absences. It's inevitable. So my suggestion would be seven committee members plus uh, two alternates. That gets you to your nine anyway. I think what we want to do is have a committee that's representative of a lot of viewpoints in town. Um, we, un we understand and we hear on a regular basis um, the viewpoints that people hold, and the idea is to bring them together um, and ask them to look at all this uh, in good faith and, and try to work together. So I don't know if I'm prepared to say tonight that seven is the optimal number, that my nine might not be better. Um, but I understand what you're saying. It takes more people to get a quorum when you have nine, but on the other hand, if people know when they're going to be meeting and how often, yeah. there might be some self-filtering of who who applies. Well, maybe we don't need to decide that tonight. Uh, right. Do we need to decide? Yes. If I might, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, I could start the recruitment as soon as Monday, um, but it would be nice to know how many committee members to recruit for. It was difficult on some occasions to uh, gather a quorum for the recent ad hoc committee. Um, it, of course, it's you know your your decision. Um, we could start gathering applications um, as soon as possible on the city's website under um, I forget what the title is under. Um, Oh, there's a uh, oh what on the on the home page on the left hand side there is actually a tab that you can go to uh, records I forget what the, what the proper title is but the um, the boards and committees application is available so if you want to share that information with constituents and we could start um, gathering the applications but. Um, I think one of the issues with the ad hoc committee uh, this time uh, that affected the ability to gather a quorum, I mean this past time with uh -huh. the water rates, was they were meeting uh, in the daytime a lot in oh, the mornings. I, I know that we ha they had a conversation trying to determine what was the best time mm -hmm. that worked for all of them. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how that came about. And we tried doing it, having them some of the evening, trying to, you know, help with... Yeah, because we, we also received a lot of comments that it wasn't, um, a, a lot of people can't, who want to observe, uh, can't come to meetings uh, during the daytime. And so I think we have to consider, uh, you know, that this committee may be meeting on the evenings or it might be meeting in on the weekends. Um, it may interrupt their personal time. On the other hand, I suspect we won't have such a hard time getting a quorum as you know, what happened a couple times with the Ad Hoc Water Committee. I, uh, may I interject? Um, I want to be careful that we spend enough time on, on this issue that uh, is of concern to me, and that is uh, adequately describing what, what this, why this committee is existing, what it's uh, its uh, responsibilities are. It's sort of an unwieldy uh, 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 committee because it's kind of looking at the the needs assessment. Uh, that's the one part of it, and and, and um, uh, inter you know reacting to that and making recommendations. But there's a second part. It's looking at the financial strategies. So I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to just ha have this uh, announced on Monday without really maybe uh, the subcommittee uh, maybe taking the time to develop uh, maybe a paragraph or two as to w who we're looking for and, w and what this committee is doing. And I also think this committee needs a, a nice name, um, <laughs> yeah, be, uh, you know, for marketing purposes, but you know, to describe what it does. And I've been struggling with that. You know, nobody's really come to grips with that. It's like we call it the Citizens Committee, and I go, well, that's really not going to tell people very much. So I think maybe the subcommittee can meet uh, one more time. I, I do agree that we should... Um, you know, move forward on on giving out the notice, but I think you and uh, that I would I would recommend that the subcommittee at least meet and with staff or alone, you know, and and kind of come up with a description of what this committee is and what the name of the committee is. It's kind uh, of basic, yeah, basic. Yeah, stuff. I, I, I agree with that. I think that you know that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I you agree know. with that. And the committee needs a charter uh, that I, I, I can look to. Description. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've got one thought too. Is that um, 
the the water and wastewater ad hoc committee was pretty specialized, um, and I think this is a little bit broader, and so it might be easier to get more people interested. Um, uh, so I would just weigh that in there that this may be a an item that's a little less specific, uh, and so so nine might be a good number because it would allow for more perspective uh, on it. I still think you're going to need some alternates. Uh, so if you if you have nine, I would recommend uh, two alternates. But I think that's awfully large. That's the problem that I'm having. Uh, and the, the reality is that the alternates typically end up uh, participating as if they were members. It's a very small distinction between a standing member and an alternate on these uh, committees. Uh, and they and, and there are always going to be at least one absence at any meeting uh, as you move forward, maybe two. But again, maybe maybe uh, this is something that uh, the subcommittee can mull over uh, and come back with a recommendation. Mayor, I, I think that in the next uh, within the next week or so, we'll have an opportunity to sit down and chat. And the and we anticipated bringing back additional refinement and essentially additional details uh, if the if the idea was received well. And so um, we'll anticipate bringing you back additional information on September 26th. Okay, great. Great. All right. Uh, then we have the standing items. Uh, City-owned Adam Street property. Is there any oral report by staff? Mr. Housh? S essentially, that is covered by the discussion that we just had because uh, conversations about that specific piece have essentially been partially postponed until the needs assessment process can okay. continue. All right, and is, is there anything further with respect to the uh, wastewater plant? The only update I can provide right now is that um, we got our our recommendations for the well installations out there, the groundwater well, and from 17, we um, our consultant recommended seven, and we have a verbal consensus from our state um, um, liaison that he likes it, but we have to go through two extra management steps before we get the final word on that. So we're going to move forward, at least getting those seven started and scheduled, and um, see what else um, the state tells us um, their recommendations. Let me see if I understand this properly. The state, at least initially, is saying go ahead with seven, but are they reserving their, their quote, rights, end quote, to say, hey, we want more up to another 10? Is that basically where it is? Hopefully not that many, but um, at least it's a big cost savings at this point in time that um, went from 17 down to seven, and they're, we're so far con you know, concurrent with that. Okay, good. Well, let's see if we can keep them concurred. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that... Uh, brings our meeting to an end. Well, I just I had one more question before you ended the meeting. Sorry. Um, there's been some questions from constituents toward to me regarding the items uh, at the end, you know, that we're likely to hear. And the one that I did not have an answer to, and maybe you have an answer, uh, uh, Noah, is this 926 Behringer appeal planning. That was inadvertently added uh, to the list. That was a, okay. there is no Behringer appeal or no Behringer item. Okay. Uh, there will be a appeal hearing regarding the Los Alcobas pedestrian bridge item that will be before the council. Um, the appellate just informed me they are not available on September 26th, which is the date that staff was intending to bring that back in keeping with the code requirements. So we are um, working to find an alternative date that works for all parties. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Anything else? And we'll stand adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.